So we thought we'd get a little bit nostalgic in this uh, podcast and talk about games that we loved uh, back in the day that they were released and has since been put on ice and we haven't seen a new one in quite some time. So basically we're talking about the games that we would like to see brought back because there are a lot of them, even though we do get a lot of HD remasters and full-on remakes these days. And we do have those virtual consoles for the the old games to bring them back again. Um, there is still a lot of stuff out there that the only way to access it is via the high seas, which um, it works, but it's not the ideal the way. <laughs> it's, it's, not, to get it's not. It's not the way that we would want to do that. We would. Most of us would much prefer to actually support these games, and uh, that's the kind of the the last resort for a lot of them. So that is what we're going to talk about here. We'll start with uh, Trent. We're going to go through three games for each of us that we would love to see brought back in some form that um, have been ha- haven't been around since you know say the PlayStation Two, GameCube era, or before. Before, so Trent, what's your first one? So because you're limiting me to the GameCube and the PlayStation 2 era, I can't talk about the awesomeness of anything from Sing because you refuse to admit that the Wii and DS era is now retro and don't want to feel old. <laughs> well, you, so... I'll, I'll give you an exception, Trent. You can pick one game from Sing. So what one game from Sing would you like to see brought back? You know, normally I would go like say like Hotel Dusk and stuff like that. But right now I want more uh, Another Code. I just feel like... You know, because the character was the aged as it was released, so the release date was the character's age, I feel like there's some stuff they could do now. Ashley would be like, what, 30? Because essentially she's the same age as me because in game law, so she's like 91. So, yeah, there's stuff they could do with that. Oh. But huh. wouldn't... See, the thing with seeing or that, the, the Another Code game, right? Now, I, I didn't play the Wii one, I must admit. I did play the DS one there was a lot of stuff that relied on the DS hardware, right? That would make it difficult to bring that game back. Like, I I get the sense that more than anything else, that's probably the problem that they face with that series. Well, the Wii one did the gimmicks of the Wii. So, like, anything that which were puzzles were based around the Wii mode. And the Wii version also started to move away from more puzzle stuff. It was more story-based as well. Uh, in that sense, like it was less gimmicky if there were puzzles. So they could do essentially that with the Switch. And because the Switch essentially has two Wii modes, they could kind of do similar sort of concepts there anyway. Yeah, the Switch has a lot of gimmicks. I mean, even the PS5 controller has a lot of gimmicks. They could they could do something like that. Yeah, I guess. It, it's more for me that if you're going to bring that series back, you would need to bring those original games. And that's that's kind of the problem. You need to give people the ability to, to step in um, and, and re-experience those. The DS one had things like you had to close the lid of the DS to solve some puzzles, and um, that would be hard to emulate, I guess. But then again, that was also I should find a way anyway. Did that that stamping sort of motion was like pretty much pioneered, I guess, in another code like WarioWare and all that were kind of later in the DS's life, so. Hmm. Um, it was, it was a, a pretty unique puzzle. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And yeah. same was the blowing on in the microphone. That was uh, relatively new because uh, the Nabucco came out pretty much like only. I think it was a launch title in Japan. It was really close to launch the like it the was. original game. And yeah. it was one of those so, games that came out in that era where they were like, "We have all these tools in the DS. Let's use all of them." What I what I liked about it was that they didn't necessarily tell you that was the solution to the puzzle. You had to play around with your DS physically to figure out some of that stuff. So I really like that. Uh, it, it would be good to bring it back for sure. Um, Harvard, what about you? What would be your first choice? Uh, so, oh, I just realized that we get a free one from the the GameCube. And the, what is it? The um the next era. Can I, can I, can I steal that opportunity as well? And say, yeah, right. Nintendo Land? Sure. That's, that that's like back? a new game, dude. <laughs> No, it's not. It's from it's the such a new game. It's not a new game. Oh, it's that's, a new, you say a new that's game. That's from basically the same time as another trace card. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the concept is cool, right? The idea of just having like mini games from all these franchises that they have and really committing to it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I like Nintendo Land. That was that was the closest I got to enjoying the Wii U. Um, it it was good. 
it, it definitely made good use of both the, of the hardware. I think um, it was Nintendo's effort to to do Wii Sports, but for the Wii U to to use a game to explain the console to people. Yeah, and but I think the concept it was... of it is having all the franchises have their own little outing and mechanically explore things that were meant to be enjoyed with friends or just for a little while and bring back new life to all these franchises we haven't seen in ages. I think that's just such a cool concept and I'm so sad they didn't do that with the Switch. Well, they did that um, one, two... That's whatever. not the same thing at all. That was not the same thing. <laughs> That's like that was the way the... play of the Switch. Like it's not really the same thing. <laughs> that, that was the game that they used to do, to explain the Switch to people. They did, but they and didn't. And the guy, they the guy on the trailer where he's the... like, "This is ice," shakes the controller. One <laughs> <laughs> uh, Two Switch is a very different game, and no one's. Uh, maybe I can't think of anyone in twenty years being like, "Oh yeah, that game where you shake the champagne bottle." That's a that's a game you need to bring back. <laughs> See, we play at least had the cow game and all the other stuff. I just don't think one two switch really had that connection with people. Like the we play was everyone's like, oh, you go play we play to get the cow game. And I think the tank game was the also in game. we play. Oh, people love yeah. the tank game. The tank, the tank game, game was good from we play. Is yeah, is still game was good. life today. <laughs> There's right. like five games that I just said. <laughs> <laughs> so that was your not actually retro at all game. Very good, Harvard. <laughs> it's retro. Uh, you can't get for, it now. For, for me, I'm going to start by going back to the PS2 and say Chaos Legion. The reason for that is actually Chaos Legion is one of my favorite games for the PS2 era. And it is one of the few that just doesn't work on anything that you acquire via the high seas. Like it's just, it's a game that's beyond the processing power of like all these devices. And um, even on PC, I think the emulator struggles with it as well. It just doesn't work. So they haven't quite figured that one out yet. So I haven't been able to play Chaos Legion since it was on the PS2. And that annoys me greatly because it was an excellent game. And um, one of those ones I think that people would realize was better than it was back in the time because i remember when it was released it was getting you know fives and sixes from most places but the problem was it was releasing at the same time as devil may cry um and aesthetically it looked vaguely similar so of course the critics were like oh this is just a bad devil may cry but it's actually an entirely different game and um, oh is it does... like a beat em up no it's it, it's like um it is a it is a beat em up like superficially it is like devil may cry it's an action game with you know, um, that kind of thing. But the difference is rather than doing the fighting yourself, you need to summon these units into the battlefield to do the fighting for you. And you've got like a bunch of different types of units. There's some defenses some attack, there's ranged units and whatever, and you've got to summon the right units for the situation. Uh, and the, it's not strategy, it's, it's still action, but um, it added some tactical depth to it. And it, it was really neat. And it, it was a very... Um, story-driven thing where the developers explicitly said that this has been inspired by opera like this is an operatic game like <laughs> that's explicitly what they're out there talking about which is of course the quickest way to kill the commercial potential of a game ever but it worked for me i i really liked it it was uh, this really neat game and i haven't been able to play it since because nobody's managed to get it to work so just fix, you know re-release it Capcom, you 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 re-released all the Devil May Cry games and Onimusha and the rest of them. Oh, is it Give also me... a Capcom game? Yeah, it's a Capcom game. Give me Chaos Legion back. Just stop being bastards and do it. I've heard you describe this game a few times, and I still have no clue what it is like. Yeah, Every imagine time I find out something new about it. <laughs> imagine what Devil... I can gather from Matt's explanation is it's basically Elden Ring, but you just play summons. No, not like that. <laughs> See, you, you have no clue, Matt. It's like, the, the, like I said, the best way to describe it is it's like Devil May Cry, but rather than doing the fighting yourself, you you, you, you summon units into the battle to do it. And the units are like five, like four or five like soldiers per, per summon. So, do you control them or are they like AI? No, they, they, they go and fight themselves. But the, when they're summoned, you're pretty you, you you your character slows down a lot and so pikmin pikmin uh, yeah it sounds it's like you know sounds you like a pikmin thing. and you throw the pikmin and then you've got like a group of like warriors i guess and then 
but instead of like one single Pikmin when you spawn them, it's like a group of them, and then they go out and attack. Like I mean, people the, like yeah. The the <laughs> best the best comparison is a game that I know you two haven't played, but um, the Knights of Azure games that uh, Koei Tecmo have, developed. I have I have played those games. Okay, so I also don't understand those games. <laughs> they're probably the closest to a, being a spiritual successor to Chaos Legion that we've got. Okay. Um, so that's oh, okay. vaguely what they're like, um, and. Yeah, it, it it is a uncommon thing, and it would just be nice to see it brought back. So maybe I played Knights of Azul wrong because I was playing it like a Warriors game and ignoring no. all the summons. No, no, like, were they supposed a... to actually spec into the summons? Yeah, the, the summons were ninety nine percent of that game. Like, ah. You were It was impossible to finish without doing that, without so that's engaging with that it. system. Yeah, 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 that's definitely why you didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Trent, your second pick. Well, I'm going to go with a GameCube game, like, uh, but a lot of the GameCube games are more like, you know, I've had like spiritual successes or like, you know, games in that sort of genre anyway, like, you know, Dosh and the Giant, you know, there's been, you know, other sort of like, you know, God games which, you know, replicate that or Griffpedia, like that looks cool, like an Animal Crossing game only came out in Japan, but really there's been a lot of indie games which do that. So what I'm going to go with is um, Nintendo's era of pinball games right at the end were really great. Like you had like Metroid pinball on the DS and then you also had o- Odama on the GameCube. And I really think that we just need some crazy, bizarre pinball games from Nintendo again. Yeah, they did a couple of them, didn't they? Because there was also Mario pinball. There's Pokemon uh, pinball, and which was Pokemon- a very good series. Pokemon Pinball. So actually, Nintendo did do quite a lot of pinball games. I don't think I ever played the Metroid one, but I did play the other ones. They were good. Pinball's a hard sell now, though, because Is it? you can't do a... Well, you had to do like an eShop pinball game. It'd be a very a much more niche thing. Whereas I, I definitely remember back in the, the days where you had to go to a game store, you were more likely to pick up a pinball game off the shelf and be like, oh, yeah, I'd buy that. I don't know. I like, I think that pinballs had a real resurgence in resurgence in recent years. So among theme, certain audiences, theme, theme pinball would probably do quite well. You might need to do a couple of different tables, but if you're to take, you know, four or five of Nintendo's properties, and do pinball tables around each of them, that could be pretty actually. Good. Yeah, that would be awesome. That would work. You could say it could be a Nintendo Land style game. Nintendo Land style game with pinball. <laughs> I mean, you, the, the Nintendo's, Nintendo's got so many interesting properties. I mean, imagine imagine a Xenoblade Chronicles pinball. That would be great. That sounds ridiculous. That would be amazing. The Skyrim pinball that Zen Studios did was really good. So Xenoblade Chronicles pinball would be great. I feel like DDNet is one of the sites that genuinely does put a lot of coverage into pinball mostly owing to your interest in it matt i can't think of a lot of other games press that will talk about pinball specifically about what makes each table unique normally they just be like oh it's a pinball game you know what this is next <laughs> yeah i mean but but by the same token somewhere there's coverage for zen studios because otherwise they wouldn't be able to continue doing what they do with pinball and zen pinball is pretty huge these days so there is some kind of audience out there and they are talking about the games in some way. And I, I do think that Nintendo, because a lot of pinball has always been about the property uh, and to this day, the new pinball tables that get made around Guardians, Guardians of the Galaxy and whatever else, they're always based on a property. It's about taking the property and turning it into a pinball thing. Nintendo has got the most valuable properties there is. So it's kind of a slam dunk idea to turn it into a pinball collection, I would think. They could they could work with Zen Studios, <laughs> you know, like they just get Zen Studios to create a bunch of Nintendo pinball games. Zen Studios has done that before. They worked with uh, Koei Tecmo to make a Ninja Gaiden pinball table quite a while while ago, and it was excellent. So there you go. If anybody from Zen Studios is in listening, just talk to Nintendo and make this happen. That would be great. <laughs> Harvard, what about you? What's your second choice? Second choice. This is a very personal one for me. It's going to be Jet Set Radio. But in a very Didn't they make a way, spiritual sequel to that sometime they, recently? Probably. Oh, yeah, they did. There was like Bomb Rush something. I can't remember what it was called. People keep trying to make spiritual successes. It never quite hits the same. And I think the the reason why is because 
they keep fixating on the gameplay side of things, which is kind of like a skating game, not really like a skating game, much more like a platformer where you're trying to make your way through levels, get to certain points as fast as you can and not fall off obstacles, which is right. very different from what you expect from like a 24 game, right? It's not about pulling off cool tricks. It's actually about learning this small sandbox level, finding the correct path and then getting through it as quickly and as successfully as you can. But right. the good thing about that series, though, is actually the style, the graphics, and the music, especially. So the experience of playing it is like feeling like you're in the late 90s. And the newer games haven't been able to capture that quite as well. And that's why they can't bring it back either. Maybe licensing yeah, they can't. a nightmare for that thing, for that series. Oh, uh, it's not too bad. They actually got it back on in 2013 with the HD remaster. A lot of the music is actually in-house. Oh, right. so oh I see, a, I see. There's a composer, Hideki uh, Naganuma. He's he's responsible for about half the soundtrack. And there's a, right. a couple of licensed tracks from Japanese indie bands that I think I got cut out. But yeah, it's, it's just two of its time. And if you wanted to make a new one, you would be effectively making a period piece. You would be making a, here is what people in the 90s thought the 90s was like, instead of anything even slightly modern. Well, there is still an audience for that. Like, I've never played Jet Set Radio, I must admit, so I, I don't know about that game. But I do know that uh, a lot of other games that are kind of of that time and of that period, like Crazy Taxi and um, Cruisin' World, Cruisin' USA, whatever, the, the Midway Cruisin' series, they mm. all got spiritual sequels and or official new titles. And they were they were very, very well received. There is definitely a, an audience out there these days for, for people that are nostalgic. Um, and that's why uh, we we do see a lot of these remakes, remasters, and retro style or retro console releases and stuff. There is a huge audience out there for the nostalgic. So I don't think that saying, "Oh, this is you know a product of the '90s" is necessarily a, a negative for a, a game. I think that's okay these days, and they'd still find an audience anyway. It might not be. I think it depends on the nostalgia cycle. Maybe the nostalgia cycle is not there yet. It might. It might well, not. I think sell it's as... close. I, I think it's awfully dangerous to say that the '90s is a good thing to be nostalgic about. Uh, I mean, '80s had that. You know, there was more fun, and I guess you know stuff which people took out of the '80s. '90s, I don't know. Like '90s was really more of the same of the '80s, but then they're like, "Let's ruin it," and then it was that really <laughs> awkward transitional like decade before it became like what the early ooze had, and then like you know. That that then became the tens. Like I really, I really think the the decade. Well, when I was like zero to like twenty was the worst. Like, <laughs> once we got out of the tens, I, I I think you know, like media and stuff started to find its own style. I I really like that really nineties, especially early ooze was just gross. <laughs> He's don't be nostalgic Eric. for it. <laughs> I'm so I don't know about that. As, as... As somebody that grew up in in the nineties, you know there there is certainly elements about the music culture and whatever that uh, I I feel nostalgic for when it happens. Um, you were too young, Trent. That's the difference. It's definitely uh, that, a, a, that was good. It's a music. specific taste. It's Ish. like almost like you're laughing at yourself. The the grungy music and the the outlandish clothing and just the the kind of like over the top rebellion, but not rebellion. I really like that atmosphere and that's really clearly captured in jet set radio of all things cool well, you gotcha just play splatoon but that's that's pretty much my takeaway just play splatoon splatoon is no splatoon is a relentlessly 2022 game same style same no. music Splat culture splatoon is... just squids <laughs> splatoon is relentlessly 2020s <laughs> that's just what it is um Okay, so for my second pick, I'm going to go with the classic horror series, Clock Tower. I'd like to see Clock Tower come back. There was a time where Capcom, this is Capcom two, two from two for me so far, but Capcom was like this amazingly uh, experimental publisher back on the play, PlayStation 2. Uh, Clock Tower 3, then there was Haunting Ground, then there was Gregory Horror Show, there was Rule of Rose. They just kept pushing out these. Oh, did they publish Rule of Rose? Yeah, they did. Interesting. There was just all these relentlessly um, creative horror games that they were pushing out. And um, 
some of them didn't review particularly well, but again, in time since they've become quite well respected, like Clock Tower 3 and Haunting Ground in particular didn't do great reviews at the time, but in the years since these days, people look back at them and, and see their qualities and see where they're, because back in those days, there was the ability to to do horror in a way that wasn't just about, you know, big, ugly monsters that you shoot. There was the opportunity to do horror where you can't fight back, stalker horror style things and a, yeah, a whole was bunch of other things. For that era. The, yeah, I can't was. think of anything that came before that. It was. I mean, the, the actual point and click horror clock towers one and two were a little bit like that, but being point and click games, there was a, a little bit different in the execution, but yeah, this was all quite new back in those days. And Do I you know what like... they also published. They also published Glass Rose, which was a sing game. Mm. I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's but... also a horror. <laughs> I, I, I don't necessarily like where horror has gone in the years since. There are some in individual horror games I like, but for the most part, horror has just become action games with monsters and uh, or bloody action games, sorry, with monsters. And to me, that's not really horror. Horror obviously has a lot of violence and has a lot of bloodletting. But you look at cinema and stuff, uh, horror is not about that anymore. That's kind of a part of the, the storytelling process. And I think that video games have taken horror in a spectacularly stupid direction that I, I'm really not a fan of. So when I look at the horror games that I really enjoyed, it's almost always back at that PS2 era. And of those games, kind of Clock Tower 3 is, is my personal favorite. So I would like to see that series make a return. Did you ever play the the Red Candle games? So Detention and Devotion? Yeah, I played um, Detention. That was good. I find I also... that they take a bit of inspiration from those series. They do, they do. I, I also played the Korean one that had two like games, the coma, the coma, the coma, ones. yeah. And they were they were similar as well. Um, but we're talking about very indie things here. The Clock Tower Three and the Haunting Ground and whatever they were major releases from a major. Oh culture. yeah, they were too. Yeah, so different kind of scale these days. Major horror releases are just, you know, the Evil Within and um, and like. I've been told the Resident Evil, Evil Village. I like good. I, I like Resident Evil Village. Don't get me wrong. I really enjoyed it. In fact, it's a different it a thing. Very, yeah, very positive review. But it is an all action kind of, you know, big violence game that is intense. But it's not for me. Horror is as much about the mind as it is about the visceral thrills, and mm. it, that is definitely lacking. Even the Silent Hill. I mean, I'm really, really excited for the announcements that they've just made about Silent Hill. Um, I'm not. The, I'm not uh, as about as we that. talk as as we talk about this uh, uh, last week, you know, as we record this podcast last week, Konami had a big thing where they announced all of their Silent Hill roadmap, and while some of it is is something to be cautiously optimistic about, I don't think uh, I'm not expecting too much from the Silent Hill two remake, given that it's a Bloober team project. But yeah, I don't trust the, them at all. There's a new Silent Hill coming that has the writer behind Higurashi. Um, involved the Higurashi horror visual novel series and that promises to be something spectacular because it's taking Silent Hill back to where I think Silent Hill should be which was Silent Hill 1, 2 and 3 were these psychological horror games that were much more about the mind than the visceral thrills after that the series you know progressively became much more about just violent bloodletting because it started to be developed by western developers I think that's personally where I think as that someone who happened. last played Shad Memories and was like Shad Memories is like the pinnacle of Silent Hill. I'm actually really excited for like all the new stuff. F looks really really good, and I think that's different to the other one you mentioned, Matt. Or is it the one? No, you no. Mentioned? F, this is two. F F is the one that the <clears throat> um, Higurashi when they die writer is involved with. Yeah, that's, but there's the, the other, there's another one as well, which is a new Silent Hill, which also looks relatively okay. Yeah, I yeah. must admit I didn't pay attention to that. I was too excited from the F uh, announcement. I'm just a bit yeah, where is they the announced five at once. That just seems odd to me. I don't really know what what's so weird about it, but oh, they're just re it... they're they're planning on relaunching the series. That's really what it is. Like mm. the idea is to make a big explosion with this by giving people a lot of different Silent Hill games and try and reestablish it as a major horror franchise so i don't have a problem with that after so many years of being on ice it's good that konami is actually investing in the series but 
Um, and developing games again, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, some of the, some of those Silent Hills are, I'm not sure about. Like I said, I, I don't mind Blue Team. I don't think they're right for Silent Hill too. Um, I but there are other ones which give me a lot of hope that somebody out there is going to try and recapture what horror should be to me, rather than just big action. Um, what about you, Trent? What's your third pick? So I'm more for. Actually, I just realized I could actually, instead of saying what my third pick was originally going to be, I was going to say Ice Climbers, I could actually say Survival Kids, because Survival Kids is yes. on the game by color. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, because I was so, going to say that, but I wasn't. So I totally agree. Bring it back. Bring that back. Yeah, so so like it ended up becoming Lost in Blue, and Lost in Blue had the free games on the DS. Uh I mean, they progressively got better. I really did like the third DS game, I think. But they, I feel like they were very same in terms of their directions. People stopped um, playing them, unfortunately. People played the yeah. first one and they went, I don't need to play the second one. I know what this, this is about. Yeah, because the, the original DS one was like, oh, this is what we will do on the DS. And then it was very rough. And then I think the second one was like a little bit of improvements and it was getting back into the mojo of what survival kids really was at its core. And then the third one was like really, really good at that. And the Wii one was also, I actually didn't mind the Wii one. Like the Wii one was enjoyable. Um, but yeah, by that point, everyone was lost interest in the series, but I mean, the original two survival kids games like the second one was like you know crazy in terms of how it went with like the evil lair guy evil villains like like you've got the lava mountain you get helicoptered to the lava mountain like it's just like what can we do to make this evil villain on this island like you know compelling and just ticking over a box like you know it's like some kind of james bond villain like you're on a lava island you know you've helicoptered in like and you got kidnapped like it's crazy what two did but two never came out in the west and yeah people in the west yeah. don't even know it's a full series they're just like oh yeah i remember that one lost in blue game on the ds but there's a whole lineage of game boy games and i think there's one on the advance as well there's so many games in that series and... I think the the challenge for them to bring that back would be that everybody would be expecting it to be a survival game. Oh, and but that's the thing. They're not. They're not even anything I know, like but it would survival be, games that we have. It would be difficult to resist the temptation to make it a survival game because that is kind of the expectation for like that kind of game. Stuff was at its core. Like you did, ha but it was like. Like, Matt, you really hate, like, survival games in terms of the realisticness of, like, oh, let's go kill a deer. But, like, let's the original ones were... <laughs> yeah. No, no, you know, no, I don't, I don't like... Shoot, get get attacked by this bear. bear. I, I don't like survival <laughs> games because they tend to be, like, just just a grind. I, I, I have no interest in chopping up a wood log to get 70,000 sticks so I can build a little hut. That just doesn't appeal to me. Um, well, well, the original liked... games had those mechanics. Like they, they were very the core. Like you just got, but they were just more simplified. You want like twenty thousand bushes, and then you get a thing. It was like, okay, well, let's go collect like one or two sticks from the beach. Let's collect like a like a ropey vine thing, and then suddenly we've got a fishing rod. Like the mechanics to build things were a lot more simpler, even than the DS and the Wii one. Like it wasn't overly crazy in terms of what yeah, survival yeah. games end up becoming yeah, yeah. I, I, but the focus I, is more on the characters and the relationship between the characters i thought what that series did so well was that yes it had you making resources to survive but that was always connected to people that you care about and here's people that you want to keep alive and you want to stay with you as you find your way off the island yeah yeah yes, I, I, I really more, it was a dating sim <laughs> I, I did enjoy <laughs> Isn't everything I... I did enjoy Survival Kids on on the Game Boy. I, I did enjoy it a great deal, but yeah, I, I just think that it would be difficult for them to make that game to bring it back because the expectations about what they could do with it would be would be not not particularly interesting. Anyway, uh, they Harvard, could do a Netflix pick. Castaway TV show. <laughs> Harvard, your third pick. Uh, third pick. I'm gonna go with the just the concept of Game and Watch. Because I played the GB, the first time I actually played them was the virtual console on the 3DS, I'm showing my age here, and they had the gallery releases of the original Game & Watch games, but they also had Nintendo styled for then modernizations. This is people in the 90s modernizing a game from the 70s, uh, and they are such good games. They are 
really, really excellent games, unexpectedly fantastic for when they were made, to the point that you could play the original one from the 70s and just have a great time. 70s, 80s, I don't remember. Um, but I was surprised at how well each one individually is designed. They're so timeless, not in a Atari Pong is great for its time game, but a I could play this in 2022 and have a fantastic time doing it. Yeah, uh, it is surprising to an extent, I think, that they've stopped doing the Game & Watch Gallery releases. Um, I don't think they have faith in the premise anymore. I think well, they I, I just don't think I, I just don't think they can think of a way to make them, you know, um, worthy of a release in, in 2022, because I think with the GBA Game & Watch, um, that was basically everything. That was pretty much all the major Game & Watch games, and they did modernizations of pretty much all of them. So there wasn't too much more they could do with it. Um, but I agree, it would be nice to see them continue to to find ways of releasing this stuff and yeah, I kind uh, of make it GBA accessible because uh, a, a lot of people really should play them and understand, you know, this was the, the history of Nintendo. This is the first handheld games. This is what they used to be like. And this is what people loved back in those days. So yeah, it, it would be good to see them find some way to bring them back. It'd be great if they could like, create some new ones <laughs> um, well i did hardware for the mario and zelda uh anniversaries but they were just like oh let's chuck some nes games on them sort of thing like they yeah they, that wasn't like, that was zelda an actual and game mario of... have heritage in game and watch and they could have done some really good stuff there yeah that that wasn't actual game and watch hardware that was like a just a a little handheld you know gaming console so but you're you're right they it would be great if they just created some new designs and um, packaged them up somehow in a way that was like a celebration of the history of Game & Watch plus some new stuff. What would Game & Watch be like in 2022? That would be pretty cool. That would be amazing. I didn't even think of that, but imagine that just having that it would be so cool. Mm. Um, and then for my last pick, I'm going to go with Lost Kingdoms. The reason for this is uh, from software is kind of stuck these days. Um, they were a little bit too successful with Demon Souls and Dark Souls and now Elden Ring. That's basically all they're ever going to be making for the rest of their existence. But before that, before those days, they were a pretty experimental developer. They created a whole bunch of very different game ideas. And Lost Kingdoms was probably my favorite of those. It was a GameCube game where <laughs> you collected a deck of cards and you would... Uh, run into enemies on on the field, and then you would fight those enemies by actually summoning the cards to the battlefield. So actually not that similar to Chaos Legion, I guess. Um, and it had the mechanics of, you know, collectible card game or trading card game, but it was fought out in real-time battles um, with with the deck of cards. So uh, a lot of people would say Bait and Katos. I'd love to see that one come back. Uh, Lost Kingdoms was like the, the real-time version of Bait and Katos with that. Uh, with a very similar sort of kind of card collecting mechanic. So that, that would be my pick. I, I would love to see that back. There was some good yeah. stuff on the GameCube that was um, very much below the surface. The GameCube would have, did not get too many releases, and the ones that people tend to think about today tend to be the ones that Nintendo themselves created. But there was some good stuff from third parties on GameCube that has been largely lost to time, unfortunately. Yeah, it's sad that Nintendo's kind of drawn the line at uh, retro emulation on the N64, and they just haven't seemed to want to step any further than that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the the Nintendo Online thing has a lot of work to do. They should be putting GameCube games on there. They should be putting the GBA and Game Boy games on there as well, but that's another the conversation like for another day. Out to the GameCube and the Game Boy Advance games, that's going to be like, oh, well, the Switch 2 is coming out now. Time to start it all over again. That's I mean, what I thought. Yeah, it's... It's not too far away from when we would expect the next Switch or the next Nintendo console to come out. And you can just see they're going to do NES and SNES games again. But, you know, uh, Lost Kingdoms wouldn't happen anyway because it was an Activision published game. And I can't imagine Activision wanting to, to go to the effort uh, again to, to bring back something from well, their very obscure got potentially publishing if library. It approves by owned by Microsoft. Like it could be Microsoft's like, Let's get some stuff out of the vault. Like that's true. We do have um Goldeneye. We do have um Banjo Kazooie. There is that, I guess. Who knows? Fingers crossed that would be pretty good. It's like the only good thing about corporate consolidation is that all these old titles come back. 
well for as long as it becomes worth it while doing it i, I have no faith in microsoft doing things for for benign reasons um <laughs> they're not exactly a pleasant company but anyway um that's another conversation for another day that is that is our list that is our games that we would like to bring back that we played we loved and um haven't had a chance to play again since thank you very much everybody for for tuning in to the podcast this month it was a, a good chat and thanks trent and harvard for being involved uh and i don't have anything else to say do chat to let us know how you what you thought about the podcast and your own games if there were any that you would uh, like to mention that you would like to see bring back do let us know uh, we do like to hear back from people and we will see you next month. <laughs>